this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. The Waffen SS was one of the most formidable German military formations of the Second World War. Feared for its tenacity and ruthlessness in battle, notorious for the atrocities it committed. As a distinct fighting force derived from the Nazi Party's SS organisation, it stood apart from the other units of the German army. Its origins, structure and operational role during the war are often misunderstood and the controversy still surrounding its conduct makes it difficult today to get an accurate picture of its actions and its impact on the fighting. To discuss the SS, I'm joined once more by Anthony Tucker-Jones, whose book Hitler's Armed SS, the Waffen SS at War 1939-45 was released last year. Anthony, Welcome back. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Now, let's start with the formation of the SS. When were they created? Did they um, predate the SA, the, the brown shirts? One of the things I you know, kind of discovered fairly quickly when I was researching this book is that SS tends to get used as a blanket term for all the Nazi organisations that came under Himmler. And there are lots and lots of them. Uh, because in a way, the title of the book is a bit of a misnomer. You know, it's Waffen SS or Armed SS, whereas actually a lot of the SS were armed anyway, irrespective of whether they were actually the combat organisation of the SS. But the original SS, the Schutzstaffen, started life out as simply as a bodyguard for Hitler during his early days of the rise to power. But actually, the brown shirts kind of predate them. So the brown shirts, the SA or the Sturm Abteilung, which basically means storm battalion or storm detachment. You're right, were thugs. You know, they were, they were the street fighters who basically prevailed over all political rivals on the streets, predominantly the communists, obviously, because there was still that sort of post-war fear that socialism or communism would take, take grip in, in, in Germany. But what happened was you had the SA under Ernst Röhm, who was a close ally of Hitler's, who turned the SA into a very, very large and quite threatening organisation. You know, it had units across Germany. And Hitler became very aware during his climb to power that if he wanted to remain in power and be safe, he would need something to counteract the SA. So initially, the uh, Schulstaff or the SS, which were his sort of little bodyguard organisation, not quite a big group, commanded by a chap called Sepp Dietrich, they were there just to, there to look after him. But slowly and sure, surely, Himmler um, persuaded Hitler to let him expand the SS. So the SS grew during the 1930s. And I say it's quite important. So the, the SS that you and I would know are the ones in the black uniform. You know, if we say SS, we always think of them in black uniform. Uh, and that's a good way to tell the SA and the SS apart, as the SA were dressed in brown. Uh, and obviously the SS had black uniforms to differentiate them. But the black uniformed SS are basically SS Algemein, which is the general SS. They were sort of uh, everyday general purpose SS sort of guard units. On top of that, you've got obviously organisations like uh, the intelligence organisations. You've got the Gestapo, the SD. I say there's a complete alphabet soup of Nazi organisations that came under Himmler. But what happened was that slowly but surely Himmler persuaded Hitler that actually the SS should create formed armed units on a similar basis to the, the German army. Uh, and it always slightly amuses me because everyone refers shorthands to the German army as the Wehrmacht. But of course, the Wehrmacht actually is German armed forces. So it encompasses uh, the Heers, which is the German army, Kriegsmarine, the Navy, and obviously the Luftwaffe. So you had those three organisations that very firmly came under uh, the German armed forces high command. And then outside it, you've got the emergence slowly during the 1930s of the Waffen SS. And what Hitler did was during the early wars, so during the Blitzkrieg years of 4041, when the SS were only sort of regimental size, they had, you know, three or four regiments of these guys, he allowed them to take part in those early campaigns because it gave them combat experience. And because they performed well, that's what slowly persuaded Hitler 
to permit their expansion even bigger. But I've got slightly ahead of myself because in 1933, when he came to power, uh, the SA took to the streets to celebrate Hitler's political victory. And that frightened the German establishment. You had thousands, tens of thousands of brown shirts on the streets, uh, you know, in every major German city across the country, and particularly in Berlin. Um, I can't remember what the figure was, 50,000, 50, you know, tens of thousands of brown shirts celebrating, parading. You know, and the German authorities, particularly the military, said to Hitler, you know, we don't like this. They are a threat to German order. If you don't, if you don't rein them in and keep them under control, they could be a threat to German stability and they will rival um, you know, the existing state apparatus. They will be a threat to the police and the armed forces. And Hitler, obviously, with his eye on the long game, uh, having just come into power, uh, agree with them because he knew, you know, he'd spent a decade struggling to take power in Germany, that he did not want to be unseated by his political allies and particularly Ernst Rom. So which is why in 1934 you end up with the infamous Night of the Long Knives when all the SA leaders are arrested and uh, Rom and the others are murdered. And the people that did the murder, and of course, were the SS. So Hitler turned to him as SS concocted this story about how the SA were a threat and were planning a coup and all the rest of it, and promised the establishment that he would disband the SA. He didn't, but he basically neutered it, you know, killed its leadership, and a lot of its senior members of the SA uh, ended up joining the SS. So at that point, the SS became in the ascendancy. Brown shirts continued, um, and indeed some of them fought during the Second World War or ended up volunteering the SS and, and fought that way. So that's where that power struggle in the early 1930s sort of peaked. And that's what put the SS on the ascendancy. Um, and of course, for Hitler, that signaled to him that the SS, if you like, were his Praetorian guard, that he could rely on, that they were trustworthy. And that indeed, Himmler was his, his right-hand man, even though, of course, bizarrely, he, he, he named Hermann Goring, head of Luftwaffe, as his successor in the event of his death. He saw Himmler as his trusted right-hand man. So if we then flip back to the beginning of the Second World War, you've got these very standard, the regimental strength units of SS, Totenkopf and Liebenstahl uh, and Dashreich gaining combat experience. And then by 1942-43, Hitler is agreeing to the formation of whole divisions. If we then fast track to 1945, by which time uh, Himmler has got almost 40 divisions under the Waffen-SS umbrella. You know, that's a lot of troops. And by the end of the war, they were functioning in SS Corps, so it meant they were controlled by SS generals. Uh, and again, towards the end of the war, they were functioning in SS Army, so they were clearly standalone organisations. Now, 43, 44, they tended to operate under the Army chain of command, so they fought alongside the regular army. But all that time, Hitler kind of saw the Waffen-SS as an insurance policy, and that came to a head with uh, July 1944, the the assassination attempt on his life, because he then made it up in his mind that von Stauffenberg and all the others that had planned that coup to get rid of him, he had a Damascus moment and he went, I cannot, I cannot trust the armed forces any longer. So from that point on, he increasingly relied uh, on the Waffen SS. So it was all that sort of chain of events that intrigued me um, as to writing the book. The other thing that I was interested in is Hitler's obsessions with private armies. So it wasn't just the Waffen SS. He did exactly the same thing with Goring and the Luftwaffe, because the Luftwaffe had this enormous manpower, which after the Battle of Britain, they didn't really need. Look, common sense dictated that those ground force personnel and the Luftwaffe would be transferred to the army. Uh, but Goering resisted that, so ended up setting up almost 30 Luftwaffe field divisions. And likewise, despite the disaster of Crete, where they suffered heavy airborne losses, and Hitler's vowing never uh, to conduct a major airborne operation. Uh, despite that, Goring set up nearly a dozen parachute divisions. So you've got 40-odd Waffen-SS divisions, you've got 30-odd Luftwaffe field divisions, so we've got 70, plus the airborne divisions. So you're looking at about 80 divisions of troops that stood outside the army chain of command. Now, of course, the reason Hitler did that was very much it was all part of this policy of divide and rule, because it prevented the army becoming too powerful. But when you're fighting a global war, that's clearly a strategic mistake because what it did, of course, was dissipate his manpower across a whole series of organisations which actually would have been better all under the direct umbrella of the German army, 
which is actually what happened with the field divisions. I mean, they were an absolute disaster and you have to feel sorry for the guys that were drafted into them because they, you know, they were never intended as infantry, but a lot of them ended up on the Eastern Front. Some of them fought in Normandy and fought with varying degrees of success. And eventually the German army took control of them, but by which time uh, the damage the damage was done. But so going back to the Waffen SS, you, 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 both within the Luftwaffe and obviously within the, 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 the Nazi party hierarchy, you had, you had these separate armed forces. It shows sort of insecurity on that on his part, doesn't it? He can call any one of them if any one of them gets uppity. But I was I was I was going to ask about. You say they start to be used with the outbreak of war, but who was? Tra- so it's, I think it's from the late thirties they start to get armed. Who's training them? Do they have their own training policy that they've drawn up? You know, are they expecting themselves to be used in a sort of a regular army infantry role? In which case, do they bring in army trainers so they they can work within the uh, military doctrine or or are they you know how are they, how are they expecting to be used which i guess all comes back to training who's training them it's a very very good point uh, and again it goes back to himmler because himmler saw the often ss as the foot soldiers of nazi ideology so he wanted them to stand outside uh, you know the, the german armed forces much of the german armed forces paid lip service to being members of the nazi party and indeed supporting hitler but with the often ss it was completely imbued with Nazi ideology, which, of course, uh, we'll discuss later. But, but of course, that's one of the things that fueled its 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 war crimes and the atrocities that it committed because of this whole Aryan race, racial superiority, and its concept of untermenschen, you know, subhumans with with both uh, the Slavs and, and the Jews and how they how they viewed mankind. But what? Heinrich Himmler did, which was very, very clever, was he was not a military man. He'd served very, very briefly during the First World War um, in an infantry regiment, but never ever saw any combat. So he was he was simply not an experienced or qualified general. But what he did was he surrounded himself with very, very, very able SS commanders. Key amongst them was a chap called Paul Hauser, who actually was a former member of the German army. And he was put in charge of SS training not just for the Waffen SS, but for the SS Algemein and all the other various you know, SS police units and everything else. And what they did was they set up a whole series of training academies. So to, to answer your question, no, they did not go through the army training um, structure. They created their own purpose-built Nazi training facilities. And that ensured that the guys not only got the sort of training that you would expect as you know, infantrymen, gunners, or Panzertruppen. That training was also imbued with Nazi ideology, which taught those soldiers that they were racially superior. Their ideology was superior, not just because obviously the party, Nazi party, was underpinned by those beliefs, but also, of course, partly in a belief that it would make those troops fight better. That you are you are treat you are training them to be an elite. You know, you brainwash them into thinking that they're somehow superhuman you know they're they're better than everyone else and that process worked really really well certainly for the early divisions things like first ss second ss uh lesser extent probably third fourth and fifth those early that that first um cadre of divisions and then slightly later with hitler jugend which was 12th ss and then frunsburg and hohenstoffel which were the ninth and tenth ss uh which used hit hit the jugend so hit the youth they used you know, German youth that had grown up in Nazi Germany. Uh, so you've got about half a dozen divisions that were very, very good, thanks to that training regime. Obviously, the others were not so good, but we, we can discuss in a bit. Oh, so where do, you, where do you recruit them all from? Uh, you know, when you've got divisions, and you know, by the end, divisions and divisions and divisions of them, where, where, where are they? Are they conscripted or are they, do they become conscripts towards the end of the war? Uh, well, to start with, of course, the Nazi Party drew them from the Hitler Jugend, so the you know the Hitler Youth Organization, because the Nazis. I mean, they Nazified every single strata of German society. I mean, it, it, their, their indoctrination of Germany is quite quite remarkable. Now, you have to say, to be fair, the Germans at that point in history were susceptible to the message that was being delivered. Otherwise, Hitler would not have lasted as long as he did. So you had basically the Maiden Youth Organisation for the girls, you had the Hitler Youth for the boys, uh, you had the Reichs Labour Organisation as well, RAD, 
So you had all these organizations, which of course a lot of German children joined thinking that they were girl guides or the scouts. Yeah, but of course with the Hitler Jugend, in particular the Hitler Youth, they, they very fat, rapidly found that actually their weekends involved them uh, doing field training, throwing hand grenades, training with dummy rifles. So they, they very cleverly militarized their youth, you know, in the early 1930s and very effectively. And of course that created a whole gen a generation, a cadre of, of, of young German youth who were then recruited into these divisions. They obviously also used the more qualified members of the SA, uh, members of the uh, German police, because again, it's important to remember that the Germany's civilian police force was subsumed into the SS because Himmler was put in charge of Germany's, S uh, Germany's police force, uh, which is why you end up with you know, a division of SS policemen because Himmler was eventually pre prevented from recruiting more Germans because obviously the German army saw them off an SS as a rival to its recruitment programme and therefore didn't want uh, the SS taking all the cream of the best recruits. So did all they could to slow down and obstruct the Wolf and SS recruitment, which, which is, as you've highlighted, slowly but surely leads on to the dilution of the Wolf and SS with the creation of all these weird and wonderful foreign un units, many of which clearly were not, um, you know, any shape or form Aryan. In the, you know, under the Nazi concept of, of racial purity. Well, let's let's skip to them now. I was going to come to those later, but let's just skip to the la uh, there, I mean, there's Belgians, there's it's the Swedes, there's there's a whole Dutch. It's in the largest units, the Ukrainians. Yes, 14th SS. Himmler persuaded um, Hitler to allow him to recruit pro Nazis across occupied Europe, which Hitler agreed to. And of course, a lot of the occupied countries acquiesced in that policy because they saw as a hang up from the first world war bolshevism as a threat so not all not all of their recruits were necessarily of nazis but what they feared uh, was the conquest of europe by the soviet union under joseph stalin and also a lot of the quisling government leaders that hitler put in power particularly in western europe saw by providing troops to the waffenest to fight on the eastern front as a way of currying favour with Hitler for this uh, future greater Reich that Hitler foresaw for Europe. What he wanted was a United States of Europe uh, under the rule of Nazi Germany ruled from Berlin. And of course, a lot of his, uh, the pro-Nazi um, fascist leaders in occupied Europe thought if they cooperated with Hitler, that they would get some sort of political autonomy under a greater Reich. So therefore, um, acquiesced to this recruitment policy. So you're right, Scandinavia and Western Europe provided an awful lot of recruits. I mean, I think people don't realise the, the, the scale of recruitment. It's like the Dutch. The Dutch provided an awful lot of recruits for the SS. In fact, they, they ended up providing more troops for the SS than they did uh, for the Free Dutch forces. And again, Western Europeans and the Scandinavian uh, recruits recruited into orphanage actually fought better than you'd expect. A lot of them actually proved quite elite fighters and well motivated to the extent that a lot of the SS that fought on the streets of Berlin in April 1945 actually were foreign volunteers. They were not uh, what were called Reich Deutsch that had been born in Germany or indeed Volk Deutsch, which were Germans of German origin that had been recruited in the occupied territories. Uh, they were, you know, they were Dutch, they were Danes, they were French, you know, they were Spaniards. Latvians, as a whole host of foreign nationalities that ended up on the streets of streets of Berlin in 1945. They were not so much pro-Nazi as very anti-communist. Yes, I think so. But again, to be fair, they went through those SS training academies, so they 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 went through the same indoctrination. So the vast majority of them, I think, you know, it would be would, would be to say that they were ardent Nazis. But again, of course, that helped them build that combat esprit de corps that probably helped make them such good fighters. You know, a unit, particularly something like 5th SS Viking, which, which recruited um, Scandinavians, was a particularly tough and successful uh, fighting force. I mean, it fought well on the Eastern Front. Uh, it helped thwart the Red Army advance on Warsaw uh, in 1944. So certain key divisions within the SS actually helped prolong the war because they acted at certain key moments during uh, certain military campaigns to stave off defeat for Hitler. Yeah, yeah. well, I hadn't realised there was a British free corps of the operation, of the operation, 
of the SS. Him as recruiters try, tried recruiting everyone, including Brit, uh, British recruits, uh, because obviously uh, Germany had an awful lot of British and Commonwealth POWs. They tried. It was wholly unsuccessful. They tried various tactics. Obviously, what they tried to do was recruit former members of the British Union of Fascists, which, of course, was Oswald Mosley's far-right organisation um, here in Britain during the 1930s. So some of those had ended up in, in the British military, and they tried to recruit those because they thought they would make ardent Nazis. They also, I think, tried to appeal to them, hoping that they might want to resist communism and Bolshevism on the Eastern Front, and they might go through that route. But the whole thing was a complete failure. You know, they ended up with about 60 recruits tops who sort of swandered around in, in uniform, but but never a effective combat unit, you know, as as the as the Scandinavians and other Western Europe, Europeans were. You know, it, it, it's something like 11th SS Nordland, you know, which was, again, a Scandinavian formation. Again, that fought to last on, on the streets of Berlin. 33rd SS Division, again, Charlemagne, which was French Nazis, again, you know, uh, battalion of them fought to the end on, on on the streets of Berlin. But by the same token, you've got, you've got, again, probably about four or so quite good divisions recruited from Europeans. Uh, but then you end up with a, a plethora of units that are complete disasters. As you pointed out earlier, 14th SS, which were Ukrainians, or Poles, depending on how you look at it. You see, because, of course, it's important to remember that Eastern Europe's borders changed regularly, you know, before the First World War and after the First World War. They changed a lot. So somewhere like Galicia, which was sort of Ukraine or Poland or Germany, or you know, those borders constantly changed. So people's loyalty was by their ethnic background. So they, with the 14th SS, I mean, the Himmler recruited those on the basis that a lot of them were actually former members of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, and therefore were viewed as loyalists. They were also uh, Catholics, which again made them, made them good recruits. So I think they took them from Western Galicia, but not from Eastern. You know, they were they had to be careful on, on, on the way they took in. But, you know, with the Ukrainians, they, they when the notice went out for recruits, they ended up with twice the number of men they wanted. You know, 30,000 Ukrainians turned up and volunteered, and they only wanted 14,000. But, of course, recruitment was for a lot of different reasons. You know, obviously with the Ukrainians, they didn't want to re- return to Soviet rule. So, naively, for a lot of Ukrainians, they thought that you know, the Nazis might be liberators, but, of course, it quickly turned apparent that it was otherwise. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm discussing the Waffen SS with Anthony Tucker-Jones. I was intrigued by the uh, rank. Is it a meritocracy or does uh, the officers sort of uh, get the job through some, I don't know, political patronage? Um, It's a mixture of both. You're right. So you have things like political generals. So you have people that, you know, were were granted a sort of honorary SS general rank and a uniform because, as you'll be well aware, the Nazis have the uniforms. You know, every single organisation had a uniform, you know, be you a a lowly... You know, transport official on on the, on the German railways. You have a you have a uniform. You know, they were all uniform. You know, goes get back to my remark earlier that you know the Waffen SS armed SS actually wasn't anything peculiar, and actually it was quite important when it came to Nuremberg war trials at the end of the war. But yes, yeah, so you had you had some that would transfer that been recruited from the old army, so some would transfer with an equivalent rank. You had some that were political appointees, uh, say particularly sort of. The higher SS generals for the police, they, they put generals in charge of their police units and the police forces. So they weren't really what you and I would, would associate as proper military generals. And also, of course, they had an officer training system like the German army had. So, again, those, those SS training academies produced NCOs and SS officers. What I found quite interesting, and as I'm sure you noticed in the book I included glossary, is that the SS had their own ranks some of which were equivalent to the German army and some were not. Um, they had some that were specific to the SS. Some of them transferred. So you'd have something like, I don't know, you know, an SS brigade Führer, which to us would be a brigadier, or to the, the American army would be a brigadier general. So, but they had, they had lots of ranks that did not, did not translate or, or were of a lower rank than actually the equivalent would be in in. British or American ranks, if that makes sense. So it it it, it, it tends to be quite uh, confusing, and also because a lot of historians, what they tend to do, if you have something like a general mayor, 
uh, historians tended to go, well, then he's a major general, which he wasn't, you know, or, or a general lieutenant or he's a lieutenant general, which he wasn't. So you have to be careful when you translate German ranks. Uh, it, in recent years, my my preferred method actually is is to convert them into into British ranks because it, I always think it's easier, you know, for the reader to understand what what they are. So if it's like someone called, you know, someone like uh, Wilhelm Munch, who was commander in the heart of Berlin at the end of the war, is variously called an SS general or an SS brigadier. But again, he he was an SS brigade Führer, so he was actually only a brigadier. But of course, if you call him a general, then he sounds a lot more senior. You know, no disrespect to brigadiers, but... Um, but do you get two layers of ranks there then within the SS? Do you almost have a political rank and a military rank when you're... I, I was thinking you were talking. I was thinking about command and control. You know, how does that interact with the army if they've got slightly different command ranks? How does that work within the command structure of the army? And does you know if you're on a if they're on a par or not quite on a par, does the political aspect of the SS trump the the army when it came to command and control? Uh, well, a bit of both because of course the Nazi the Nazi Party would argue that political seniority trumped everything. Um, because if you're a military man, you just go, well, that's a recipe for disaster. And indeed was frequently a recipe for disaster uh, with the German war effort. But no, uh, in the case of the Waffen SS, they adopted German army uh, chain of command structure. So their divisions were organised into corps, you know, which is obviously a corps as a headquarters uh, with a corps commander and his staff, which will control, you know, two to four um, divisions. And these would then be grouped into an army. So you'd have two corps or three corps making up an army. So those were structures that the German army understood. And it also meant that when SS divisions fought alongside the German army, that structure fitted the German army chain of command. So it, so it, so it worked. But what you tended to find, of course, is although that the SS was supposed to answer to uh, the German chain of command, in the field, because you needed that, otherwise that's a recipe for chaos. You'd have famous instances where, you know, for instance, at Kharkov, where Manstein, for Marshal von Manstein, was told that his SS corps was not to abandon Kharkov, and he, um, you know, Hitler told him not to do that. He knew that was a recipe for disaster and withdrew unilaterally because he knew if he drew that, if he did that, he would then draw the Red Army forward and he could counterattack and give them a bloody nose, which is indeed what he did. Uh, but also what it did was it saved the German army's bacon there because the German army went, well, now that those two SS divisions have withdrawn, we can't stay here because we're now exposed and we can withdraw as well, which is what they did. Now, obviously, under normal circumstances, Hitler would have been absolutely furious at that chain of events. But because they counterattacked, retook Kharkov and captured tens of thousands of you know Soviet troops, he was delighted. Let's go back to the original point of your question. Yes. The SS answered to the Germans, but on occasions did their own things, which which goes back to our you know our original discussion about it, it, this dissipation of manpower into separate private armies did ultimately cause untold you know disruption because again initially the SS had their own weapons factories, um, bought their own uniforms, you know they they had their own chain supply chain because the German army wouldn't play board and because obviously they saw them as rivals or resources. And it wasn't until Heinz Gadurin ended up as Inspector General of the Panzertruppen uh, that he moved to bring the SS under the um, army umbrella to try and negate all this duplication that was going on. And also, uh, in the case of the SS Panzer Divisions, of course, to make sure that they were standardised in their composition against a regular German army uh, Panzer Division. You know, so it moves to standardised seems wrong going throughout the war, but it, it was hideously complicated. Yeah, did the SS use their political clout to get the best kit? You know, oh, there's a new tank. We want some of them, thank you, because we're you know Nazi Party men. Can we have those and the uh, the first ones off the off the production line? Yes, you you are right. Probably about 1943, they started getting some preference, so they certainly got the Panther tank and the Tiger tank slightly in advance of everyone else. And, of course, going back to, again, um, the assassination attempt on Hitler in forty-four. again, the SS increasingly got a uh, first call on, on equipment because, obviously, Hitler preferred them to the regular army. So, yes, they they did. The favouritism was, was, was shown on them. And then certainly in terms of 
you know, rebuilding them after they, the SS divisions have been quite badly mauled, they quite often would get get priority. You know, they'd be pulled out of the line quicker to be uh, re-equipped. But to be fair to the SS, quite often what happened was when their divisions were pulled out of the line to be re-equipped after they'd, you know, endured severe combat, they would quite often leave a battle group in line. So they would stay, you know, they'd have a battle group formations. You know, 5th FS did that. And some of the other divisions, particularly on the Eastern Front, they would leave. Uh, some of their troops behind while the rest of the division went back to Germany to re-equip. Something else that occurred to me, that, that they seemed to pop up all over the place, and I couldn't help but think that you know, they must have spent a considerable amount of effort shifting these units around, almost act, using them as fire, firemen. Yes, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, particularly on the Eastern Front, Waffen SS obviously were, were, were used as a fire brigade, yeah. The German army, uh, particularly by 43, 44, was increasingly getting itself trapped in pockets, <clears throat> you know, by the Red Army. Quite often, the Waffen SS would be the ones that would be tasked to cut their way through the pocket. Chikasi or Kirshen is a prime example of that, uh, where Fifth SS cut their way through, you know, a quite dense Soviet defence barrier to liberate the men in the pocket, which, which of course, again played to Hitler's obsession that the SS was somehow elite and could fix everything. Which again was part of my fascination in writing the book. Um, you know, is there is a clear trend? by 44, 45, because Hitler increasingly thought the SS was saving, uh, and that's epitomised by uh, the Ardennes Offensive, where the, the key fighting force for the SS Armour Division, and then likewise in Hungary in March 45, a lot of people don't realise Hitler tried to replicate the Ardennes Offensive in Hungary and shifted 6th Panzer Army, which he'd created for the Ardennes Offensive, stuck it on trains and very rapidly shifted it to the Eastern Front to Hungary, where it conducted a similar offensive as it had done in the Ardennes, uh, with exactly the same outcome, which time Hitler completely washed his hands of the SS. I mean, Hungary was the final straw. He was furious with them because he, he firmly believed that 44, 45, that the SS actually might turn the tide of the war um, if they were given a lead in operations. But that proved, obviously, as history teaches us not to be the case. You talk about the Ardennes. The Ardennes was just completely an SS I say it was a complete in op- SS operation. What I mean is, from the top, Sepp Dietrich's running, uh, who's the a- a- SS, is running the show, isn't he? Which made me wonder about, when we go back to the officers and command and control, if if the SS are running it, are, are they uh, capable of running? Are they trained to run such an operation with, with regular army units underneath them? Or or was it was it all SS spearhead with the army backing them up? It was essentially SS spearhead with the army backing them up. So much confusion um, was caused with a sixth Panzer Army. So for the Ardennes offensive, you had fifth Panzer Army, sixth Panzer Army, which was the new one, and obviously seventh Army. So three armies committed to that Ardennes offensive. But quite a few historians tended to refer to sixth Panzer Army as six SS Panzer Army. Uh, whereas actually, if you're going to be correct, it didn't become sixth SS Panzer Army until it shipped to Hungary. So Hitler allowed them to change its name at that point. Uh, but when it was in the Ardennes, it was really only sixth Panzer Army. But you're right. You know, it was commanded by an SS general, the key uh, teeth arms, if you like, were SS generals. And it was hit. Obviously, Hitler's sort of main hope was pinned on those two SS corps that made up sixth Panzer Army because it had those elite SS panzer divisions in it, and he hoped that they would cut their way through, through to Antwerp. To the likes of Sepp Dietrich, do they have staff officer training? Are they capable of, are they trained to run such large operations and put it all in place? Well, Sepp Dietrich's an interesting example. Um, you know, Paul Hauser had ended up being a combat commander, so although he'd overseen the training um, and recruitment of the SS in the early days, I mean, he saw combat in, in Normandy as a corps commander where he was wounded. Like Patrick had seen uh, action as a divisional and corps commander on both the Western and Eastern fronts. But I'm, I'm firmly of the view that Seth Dietrich was promoted over his pay grade. He ended up very briefly in command of, I think, 5th Panzer Army on the Western Front during the Normandy campaign and, and also, I think, 7th Army during the chaos of the collapse there. So he briefly commanded an army on the Western Front but bearing in mind, previous to that, he was a corps commander, so he only controlled two divisions. But the Ardennes, Hitler plonked him in charge of 6th Panzer Army. And I very firmly got the impression that from what Seth Dietrich said was he didn't want the job. And I'm not entirely convinced that he was capable of the job either. 
you know, there's a difference between being a divisional commander where you command a single division to a core commander where you might command two or more to being in charge of an army, you know, where you'll have dozens of divisions. And I think it was a, above Septetrix's wit to command it, quite frankly. You know, he complained bitterly before the Ardennes about not being enough time to plan, conditions not being right, and did all his utmost to blame Hitler afterwards. But it's important to remember, of course, is that the SS pretty much ran the show because Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, who was CNC West uh, at the time of the Ardennes offences, was pretty much sidelined. You know, Hitler sidelined him from that operation. Um, so the SS were very much um, in the driving seat. Lack of training doesn't necessarily stop high command, though, because Himmler, as head of the SS, manages to uh, take himself into a field command, doesn't he? One of the reasons that um, Hitler, at the same time as the Ardennes, conducted the Alsace uh, operation, you know, which, again, lots of people are not terribly aware of, but Hitler launched an attack in the Ardennes, and then it was supposed to be at the same time a diversionary attack in the Alsace. Himmler was appointed commander of, I'm going from memory, I think it's Army Group Upper Rhine, which was this sort of ad hoc army group they put together to defend the Rhine. And one of the reasons Himmler was put in charge of that was basically to keep him out of the Ardennes offensive, because uh, Hitler didn't want him meddling uh, in that. So they, they put him in charge of the Alsace uh, counterattack, which initially was reasonably successful, but then very rapidly turned into a shambles. And then afterwards, Himmler was very rapidly removed from being in command of, of that. And then I think he, he, he very briefly ended up in charge of Army Group Vistula, but again, was very quickly replaced, you know, because he'd had no training as a, as a, as a military commander. I mean, one of the things you, have, you know, it's important to remember is that generals on both sides during the Second World War, much of the training was on job. During peacetime, if you'd been through Staff College and uh, maybe commanded a division, but under normal circumstances, because you go to Staff College and you're trained how to, how to command and control uh, ever bigger army formations. Whereas what tended to happen was that probably core training, particularly for the German army during the Second World War, was fairly perfunctory because, of course, you didn't have time to go and spend a lot of time at somewhere like Werner Neustadt, the you know, military academy, being trained on how to do it. You tended to learn on the spot. And Hitler, particularly, because he micromanaged everything, kind of thought, well, he's a good core commander, so he'll make a good... Uh, so he's a good divisional commander, so he'll make a good core commander. Ergo, he makes a good army commander. And that's, and that's not the case, you know. Uh, military officers bring different things to the table. Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean to say you're good at everything. And I think that was probably the case with Sepp Dietrich. We, we haven't really touched upon the separate duties because we, we, we kind of, we have vaguely mentioned but the, with the broad brush to being combat units. But a lot of the, uh, well, a lot, what, almost what, how many of them were not combat units? Because they had, they do internal policing, they do internal security roles, policing, what what's the split? What are they all What are they all doing under this SS umbrella? Well, a, a lot of them, of course, were um, designed for internal security. So you basically had uh, criminal police. Um, you had the Gestapo, which were the plain clothes guys. You had railway police. You had civil police and various other Nazi police organisations. And nearly all those organisations were designed for in, internal security. I mean, that's partly. You know, Himmler caused the German police force a problem when he, he, when he recruited um, on its fourth SS, is it Polizei, the police division, because he basically took 15,000 police away from Germany's police force. Uh, and obviously the more able-bodied, younger ones, to form this division where you go, well, if you do that, then it's potentially you're creating a law and order problem. Uh, you may see a spike in crime if you remove that, those police. And particularly in the case of the police, they did not really want to be combat soldiers. That's not what they, you know, they joined the police to be coppers, if you like, treading the beat, chasing villains, that sort of thing. And yet suddenly they found that they're being recruited into the Waffen SS to fight as infantry, which is not, not what they wanted to do. And what they had done, particularly with the police, is that they forced them all to become Nazi party members. And a lot of the older police you know, didn't want to do that, so retired. So they lost a lot of police that way. So a lot of the SS um, organisations under Himmler were designed for internal security or, or some of them counterintelligence or some of them intelligence gathering. Uh, you know, they had a whole variety of uh, different roles. And then something like the, you know, the general SS who kind of did the ceremonial guard duties, of course, they were increasingly subsumed into the Waffen SS because a lot of them had been through the same training academies. So it was quite easy to, 
to recruit them back. And then something I don't think we have touched upon, of course, is the whole final solution apparatus. You know, so the, the murder wholesale of the Jews was overseen by, by Himmler and, and his organisation, particularly Totenkopf, the death, death heads units. And um, what happened was that they recruited SS regiments to police and control uh, the extermination camp. And a lot of them ended up recruited into the SS because I found it quite interesting at the end of the war, particularly at the Nuremberg trials, people like Paul Hauser tried to argue that the Waffen SS was separate from the rest of the um, Nazis SS organisations and they were just combat soldiers, which was painfully a lie because they had taken recruits from you know, guard units from places like Dachau, Auschwitz. So those people had civilian blood on their hands, so they recruited murderers into their ranks. And then also because of the nature of, particularly on the Eastern Front, where the war was very, very barbaric, they committed atrocities there. And then quite often when those units were then transferred to the Western Front, they committed atrocities on the Western Front. You know, you have Aradur and Wormhut and Malam Day because they had little regard for human life, but also had learned on the Eastern Front, you fight far and far, you know, because to be fair, the Red Army committed its fair, fair share of atrocities as well. Um, so it, the, the rule of law within military organisations, particularly the war from SS, was pretty eroded in, in their view of how they, they conducted themselves. How successful is that argument that they're, they're separate units? Did men cycle between the units regularly or... Irregularly, as as units, as men were needed, they should move them around. Yes, I think so. There was a lot of you know cross fertilization, but I think what tended to happen if you came from an SS organization outside the Waffen SS, once you were in it, you didn't tend to go back, you know, because obviously those combat units would would want to keep you. But in answer to your question, did that argument hold any ground? The answer is no. I concluded the book, you know, with a, a brief review of the Nuremberg war trials, and the tribunal there said. The Waffen SS were clearly part of the Nazi party hierarchy and part of the SS structure, and you could not separate them. Ergo, the Waffen SS and its its leaders and its men were culpable of war crimes, so they were treated exactly the same, which, uh, in my personal view, is quite right. Which is not to say that some of the SS conducted themselves with a certain code of honour and respected human rights and respected civilians. Uh, but within their ranks, they harboured a lot of people that, you know, in civilian life would be viewed as psychopaths or serial killers, you know, because we forget, of course, war does attract a certain type of human psyche. And obviously the war for SS had a large number of people that knew that being in those organisations allowed them to rape, pillage and murder with impunity because there was a war on, uh, and they could do it. And obviously those camp guards that came from the the Totenkopf units that came from the Final Solution organisations, you know, they had little regard for human life because of what seen and they, they'd done in those camps. I think you make a point in the book that Manstein thought they were a waste of manpower. I mean, I mean what, what do you think? I can't help but feel my, my dad saw, in 1944 thought every German was potentially in the SS and, and was a reason to be, be fearful. Were they worth it? What do you think? Yes, I, well, I think uh, combat-wise they were, because as I say, at certain key points they helped turn the tide. So tactically, they proved very successful on both West and, uh, and Eastern Front. Didn't make quite such a mark in, say, Italy, um, where, again, they're more known for their human rights atrocities than they are there, their combat fighting. And again, in the Balkans, you had all these weird and wonderful locally recruited you know, Albanian and Slavic organisations which were quite frankly a car crash. They did not meet the Nazi criteria, uh, but by '44, of course, the SS are so desperate for recruits that they will recruit anyone and everyone. And of course, a lot of the weird and wonderful units were actually only used for internal security. So, um, you know, in Yugoslavia and Albania, uh, something like the Skanderberg Division, which consisted of Albanians, and uh, there was also a Croatian unit. What the Nazis did there was they played on historic hatreds. You know, so there was always bad blood between the uh, the Croats and the Serbs, there's bad blood between the Serbs and the Albanians and the Germans played on that. And they recruited various SS divisions for that part of the world. But again, of course, playing on to those, those historic hatreds played into you know, the committing of atrocities because historically there's bad blood between those people anyway. So you put them in a uniform and gave them uh, firearms, gave them carte blanche to 
you know, at beyond the pale, which 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 they but which they did do. But going back to the original point of your question, you know, for instance, in Normandy, you know, uh, the SS helped prolong the breakout from the Normandy bridgehead there. As we both know, the SS decisively defeated um, Montgomery's Arnhem operation. You know, if they'd not been there, that could have gone differently. On the Eastern Front, they gave up their all at Kursk. OK, they didn't achieve what they meant to do, but, you know, they fought tough at Kursk. On numerous occasions, they had rescued trapped pockets of German troops. Um, they'd fought toughly up on the Baltic coast, you know, so they, they they made their mark and they made a contribution to the war effort. But ultimately, they were not war winners. You know, they didn't. Now, if if you're going to look at it in the cold light of day and code, ultimately, they were not war winners. Then you have to say, would they have not been better subsumed into the regular German army? Would those 40 divisions not have been more effective if they'd gone through, you know, regular army training and been under regular army commanders? And also not had that splitting command and control, as we discussed earlier, there would not have been any issue of Waffen SS units acting of their own volition, which they did on numerous occasions, because obviously they viewed themselves answering to Himmler and not to the likes of Field Marshal Jodl and Keitel at um, German Armed Forces High Command. So it, it, it created it created problems. So yes, I I would agree that I I think if you're looking at it bigger picture and, and long term, they should have been within the army. But then you know that's a big what if. Would that have actually made any difference to the German war effort? I have no idea, and I'd probably a fruitless exercise speculating on that. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many so many variables. You f- fix one problem, create another elsewhere. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thank you, Anthony. I look forward to chatting to you again later in the year. Loyal listener, if you want a fairly concise introduction to the development and history of the SS, Andrew's book is Hitler's Armed SS, the Waffen SS at War 1939-45. Now, if you have enjoyed this episode of the show, why not consider becoming a patron? You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. For patrons, Patreon will give you a custom RSS feed to use with your podcast software, which you can then use to get extra World War II chat and advert free episodes magically appearing on your device. As I say, I also make available extra World War II chat bits left on the cutting room floor. So patrons, look out for more from Anthony and I chatting. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And it's a big thank you to those loyal listeners who already support the show. Well, I'm not quite sure what we will be looking at next. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88mm gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. Darling, that can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.